Now, I hope you have your Bibles open at uh, Micah and chapter 7. These verses are unique because they give us an insight into the broken heart of a godly leader. Now, think about it. Micah had been preaching God's word all his life. He gave himself to this work for 50 years. God had called him to be a prophet. That means, of course, that God spoke to Micah directly, that his words are the word of God, and that, of course, is why we're studying his book today. Over the last weeks, we've followed Micah's message, but we haven't really learned a great deal about Micah, the man himself. What was it actually like for him to be a prophet? Well, the reality is that leaders don't usually wear their hearts on their sleeves, But in this last chapter of the book, we find Micah opening himself up, and uh, he shares his heart. And in these few verses, what we get is a glimpse into the inner turmoil of a leader's soul. Micah was a man with a broken heart, and I want us to understand why, so that we can learn more of it for ourselves. Look at what he says. I hope you have your Bible open, do you? Micah chapter 7, he starts by saying, what misery is mine? Now, I feel like I've almost prepared this message twice this week, and the reason for that is that once I got started, I soon realized that I was on the wrong track and had completely missed the point. Those of you who are well used to Bible study will know that you sometimes have an experience like that. Look at verse 1. Micah says, I'm like one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat and none of the early figs that I have, uh, that I crave. Obviously, you know, uh, you come to this, you read it, you think, well, this is a picture of great frustration. Micah says, I'm like a person going looking for fruit. I find there's no fruit. I don't find what I'm looking for. Things haven't worked out in my life as I wanted. My dream hasn't been fulfilled. And you go down that line, you end up with a message that sounds like this. Are you frustrated in life? Are you looking for fruit that you haven't found? Are you dissatisfied? Come to Jesus and he'll give you a more fulfilling and a satisfying life. The problem with that, of course, is that it completely misses the point of Micah chapter 7, as we'll see. What's worse, by the way, and where I realized, no, of course, that can't be what verse 1 is about, is that that line of thought completely subverts the gospel. What it does is it places us and our fulfillment at the center of all things instead of God and his glory, and that's not the gospel, right? In fact, a steady diet of that kind of ministry would produce a bunch of Christians who are looking to Jesus simply to give us a more fulfilling and satisfying life, and that's not the gospel. As soon as I realized that was where that line of thought was going, I had to rip up the notes, throw them in the bin, start again, because that can't be what Micah chapter 7 is all about, right? So let's take a closer look at what he's saying. Micah is speaking, you see, under the direct inspiration of the Spirit of God. So when he says, oh, what misery is mine, the one thing you can be sure of is he is not wallowing in self-pity. Because the Holy Spirit never authors self-pity. He doesn't lead us there. So let's take a closer look at why this man is miserable. The way to understand Micah's misery in verse 1 is to look at what he says in verse 2. Look at what he says. The godly have been swept from the land. That's why I'm miserable. Not one upright man remains. So the reason that this godly man, this prophet, is brokenhearted is not because he's feeling sorry for himself or the way his work life has worked out or anything of that sort at all. No, the fruit he's been looking for is not personal fulfillment, but it's godly character. And what he says to us is simply this, as I look out upon the landscape of my country today, I see the way people are living. I see that godly character has been swept away in my own lifetime. I'm looking for models of upright living around me, and that's not what I'm seeing as I look across the land. The godly have been swept from the land. Which land? Well, of course, he's talking about the land of Israel. That is the land where God's covenant people lived. And so it's surely right for us to apply Micah's words here 
not only to our nation, but also to the church, to God's covenant people. Uh, We may imply it this way. I look across church world in this generation, and I see the loss of godly character in our time. I'm not seeing the fruit of the Spirit, and it burdens my heart. That's what he's saying. Just earlier this year, Ronald Sider published a very, very important book It's called The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience. And the subtitle is a question. Why are Christians living just like the rest of the world? Good question. Why are Christians living just like the rest of the world? That's Micah's question. Oh, what misery is mine. He says as he thinks about it. Not only is there the loss of godly character, but he's seeing across the community the rise of self-interest. Look at verse 3 and 4. All men lie and wait to shed blood. Each hunts his brother with a net. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. The ruler demands gifts. The judge accepts bribe. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. As I look across the country, Micah is saying, what I see is the breakdown of trust. It's all about pressure groups. It's all about lobbyists. It's all about people with their own agendas. It's self-interest that has replaced the common good. And when that happens in a society or in any community, what begins to happen? Well, of course, family life falls apart. And you see that in verses 5 and 6. Don't trust a neighbor or put confidence in a friend. Even with her who lies in your embrace, your wife, be careful with your words. For a son dishonors his father, a daughter rises up against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the members of his own household. You see, what he's describing here is the complete breakdown of family life in his generation. And he says, it's breaking my heart to see what's happening. And it's happening not just in the nations at large, it's happening in the community of God's people. That's the reason for my misery, says this man of God. Ronald Sider quotes uh, statistics in this book here. He says that uh, the figures for family breakdown amongst evangelicals, those who claim the name of being born again, are precisely the same as the national figures. Precisely the same. that the statistics for use of pornography amongst those who claim to be evangelicals are precisely the same as those known for the national averages and statistics. That's a problem. Micah says, it breaks my heart. It's my burden. Loss of trust between a husband and a wife. Loss of connection between kids and their parents. Families tearing themselves apart. I'm looking around and I'm not seeing the fruit, says Micah. It's my burden, says the preacher after 50 years of ministry. Now, here's the question there for us today. Is your heart burdened about the fact that the church is so little different from the world? Does that matter to us as a congregation? Do we care about the breakdown of family life? all around us, including among us? And if so, what are we going to do about it? What will we do in the next 10 years that will make a difference to our community and the world? Will we be mission-orientated, or are we concerned simply to please ourselves? These are the questions that arise directly out of Micah chapter 7. They are the questions that burden the heart of a godly leader. I tell you, I think we need lots more of this kind of brokenheartedness, don't you? Lots more of it. 
lots more. To move beyond self-congratulation. To recognize that beneath the surface of all the statistics about evangelicalism within our land, there is a chronic decay that desperately, desperately, desperately needs to be addressed. Now, there are two things for us to learn from this passage today. The first is for us to correctly identify the problem. You see, Mike has been talking about symptoms, loss of character, rise of self-interest, breakdown of family life. These are symptoms. The question is, from what root do they come? What's the root? If you don't know the root problem, you'll never get the right solution. So we've got to be able to discern uh, uh, the problem. Why is there this loss of character? Why this rise of self-interest? Why this breakdown of relationships? Why are these things happening in our culture today? And then when we've identified the problem, we've got to discover what to do about it. So let's, with our Bibles open, look more intensely at what God has to say in his word. Let's look, as we try to examine the problem, more closely at the unanswered question of verse 10. Do you see that there? My enemy will see it and will be covered with shame. She who said to me, where is the Lord your God? Now that really is the central question of this whole passage. Where is the Lord your God? And and you have here a cynic coming to the believer and saying, well, just look at what's going on. I mean, if you look at the reality among you guys, I mean, where is God in all of this? And the striking thing, of course, is that Micah does not have an answer. All that he can say is that things will be different in the future. He's sure of that. But as he writes, he has no compelling answer to offer the cynic who says, where is your God? Now, this is, by the way, wonderfully helpful, because surely we've all been there. An illness strikes, a church splits, a business collapses, a son or a daughter abandons the faith, a tragedy strikes the family. And if the cynic were to come to you at that moment and to say, well, where is your God in this? You would be stuck for an answer. You wouldn't know what to say. You'd have to say, I haven't got a clue where God is in this. We, we find ourselves in that position often, and of course, the cynic likes to laugh at us. You haven't got a very good answer now, have you? Now, the Bible introduces us here, I think, to an important but often neglected truth about God, that he is the God who hides himself, hence our title today. This is paradoxical. Because obviously the God of the Bible reveals himself, otherwise we wouldn't know anything about him at all. But the Bible also makes it quite clear that God sometimes hides himself, even from his own people. Let me give you some scripture, and you might like to follow this through with some further study. The clearest statement of it is in Isaiah 45 and verse 15, where the prophet says outright, Truly, you are a God who hides yourself, O God and Savior of Israel. He's a God who hides himself. Job chapter 23, you could be sure if there's anything on God hiding, you'd find it in the book of Job, right? I mean, he really struggled with this. Where do I find God in the middle of all this wreckage of suffering in my life? And he says in chapter 23, verses 8 and 9, if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I don't find him. When he is at work in the south, in, in the north, sorry, I do not see him. And when he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. So it, it's almost as if there's this kind of hide and seek. I keep looking for God and he keeps evading me is what Job is saying. He knows that God is always present, but his point is that he can't find God. There's no way of working out what God is doing in these disastrous circumstances of his life. Isaiah 64 and verse 7. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us. The spirit of prayer, he says, among God's people has died. It's collapsed. People are not reaching out to God. Why? Because it seems like God has turned away. He's distant. So we come to Micah chapter 7 and verse 10, the question that, of course, is often also repeated in Psalm 42, this troubling question for a Christian believer, where is your God? He's there. We know that. But he seems awfully hidden. 
or flay hidden. Now, aren't you thankful for the honesty of the Bible? Sometimes we just don't know what God is doing. Now, thank God that Christian faith does not rest on things making sense. I would have lost my faith long ago if that was the case. But our faith rests on God's promises. If you expect to know what God is doing and be able to see it all the time in your life, you will certainly be disappointed. The secret things belong to the Lord. He hides them from us. Now, if indeed this root problem behind the loss of character, the growth of self-interest, and the breakup of the family is that in the culture God is hiding his face, then the answer will only be found how? As he turns his face towards us, right? Now, you see, that's humbling because it means that we don't have the answer. The problem is not under my control. We like to flatter ourselves with the idea that we can solve every problem. We're drawn towards self-help brands of spirituality. But if the real problem is that God has turned his face away from his people, then only God can solve that problem. And you know, when you come to the place of admitting that there are problems in your life, in your character, and in your family that only God can solve. When you come to that place, you have just taken the first step towards real Christian faith. Some of us have not got there yet. We're still in religious self-help mode. Got to discern the problem. What are we to do then when God turns his face from us? What are we to do in a situation where the root problem is that we can't see what God is doing? Two things. First, in that situation, it's time to watch and to wait. That's what Micah does. Look at verse 7. As for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God my Savior. This is the commitment of a godly man. You ask me what God's doing right now, and he's a prophet. He he can't give the answer. But he says, this is what I will do. I will watch and I will wait. Wait. Now, the good news, of course, is that God's hiding is never final. Remember, the whole cosmos is moving towards the day when God will not be hidden, but his glory will be revealed. All life moves in that direction. God may be hidden now, but he is not absent. God may seem far away from you, but he is always at work. Micah knows that God is there, and that is why he watches and he waits. Fishermen know about this. You don't see the fish, but you know they are there. So you put your line in the water, and what do you do? You watch, and you wait. And you wait expectantly. God may hide his face from you for a time, but not forever. You may find yourself in great darkness through a sudden trauma. Watch to see what God will do. Watch what he does in your own heart. Because even when he's hidden, he's working. Watch what he does in people around you. Watch what he does among other believers. And wait. Wait, because while God's purpose often takes us through darkness, it never leaves us in darkness. It never ends there. I tend to think too often of waiting as just being something I've got to endure in order to get what I want. But you see, in the Bible, waiting is very, very different. Waiting in the Bible is the way in which we grow when we do not yet have what we desire. And you know, there are gems of God's grace that can only be mined in the darker places of life. 
So if he leads you through some dark and hard places, if that is where you find yourself right now, determine that you will not come out of this empty-handed. Watch, wait. God is at work even when he's hidden. And God's promises to you are as good in the darkness as they are in the light. And that is why Micah can say in verse 8, Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. And some of us can lay hold of that today. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Don't ever forget that God's greatest ever work in all human history was done in total darkness during three hours when Jesus hung on the cross. And in this moment, nobody in the world and probably no one even in heaven apart from God himself could see what God was doing in these hours of awful darkness. If ever there was a moment where it seemed that God was hiding, it was as Jesus was hanging on the cross. Even he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you know, it was right there that the gates of hell were splintered and the path to heaven was wide open. God does his greatest work in the darkest places. So watch and wait. And then here's the second thing we're to do in these circumstances of life. And it's very simple and very powerful. And it's in verse 9. Put your hope in the gospel. Watch and wait and put your hope in the gospel. Now, Micah, of course, lived about 700 years before the birth of Jesus when the gospel or the good news was revealed. But in the New Testament, remember it says that the prophets, and that includes Micah, spoke about things that have now been revealed through those who preach the gospel. That's what Peter says in his letter. And I think this is a wonderful example of the prophets before the coming of Jesus speaking of the hope, the hope that they held even then that was fulfilled and revealed in Jesus. Look at what Micah says here in verse 9. Because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and establishes my right. Now you see what he's saying. I look around the chaos of my generation. And honestly, as I look across the big picture, it seems that we're more under God's judgment than we're under his blessing. Our culture is falling apart. Families are breaking up. God is hiding his face from us. We have sinned and we are under the wrath of God. Now, where do you go from there? We see, look where Micah goes. I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case. See, Micah's hope in the darkness is that this God whose judgment we deserve, whose judgment we have brought upon ourselves by the paths we have chosen, that this God will look upon us in mercy and take up our case. That somehow Micah hopes, prays, believes that God will come and will stand with us. That he'll be for us and not against us. That God himself will somehow take up and plead the case of his own people. That's the only hope I can see, says Micah. And he's speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine God pleading your case? Wow. Wow. This man lacks godly character. This woman is full of self-interest. This believer is at odds with members of his own household, but I plead his or her case. Micah says, oh, if only that could happen. Then some things would change. Now, you see, that is our hope, isn't it? That God should plead our case. That God who stands over us should come and stand with us. And should do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. That is the gospel. 
That is precisely what God has done for us and will do for any who will come to him in Jesus Christ. That is what we will celebrate again at Christmas. That God came down among us in Jesus Christ, that he came and he took his stand with us, that the wrath of God, which we deserve, was poured out upon Jesus when he died on the cross, and that Jesus rose on the third day, ascended into heaven, and that he stands at the right hand of the Father to do what? To plead your case and mine. You know what Micah's hope is for restoring families? You know what Micah's hope is for the reformation of character? You know what Micah's hope is for the breaking of self-interest so that a community of people will begin to look outward rather than inward? His hope's in the gospel. It's the gospel. He's not looking for a new program. He's not looking for a new set of techniques to make this happen. He's not starting a new movement. He's looking to the gospel. He knows that apart from the help of God, there's no other way that these issues will ever change, no other way that the culture will change direction, and he's placing all his confidence in the one who will come whose name is Jesus. Now I have to ask you, is that where you are? Is that where you would place your confidence on these great issues that face us? Is that what you see as being the hope of the culture, of the nation, of the church? Is that what you see as being an answer to this question? Because I know of no other answer. See, this is where the Apostle Paul took his stand. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of those who believe. You know, I felt privileged to have the opportunity of speaking to groups of pastors around the country over these last months. And the message that has been laid on my heart to share with other church leaders has been to sound a trumpet for recovering our confidence in the life-changing power of the gospel. And I've lost count of the number of other pastors who've come And I've said with the greatest warmth, thank you so much for saying that, because that's what I believe, but it's not what we hear. You see, we say we believe the gospel. But then set out on some endless search for something else that's supposedly going to bring what we call real life change. What do you think will bring real life change to a man or a woman or a father or a mother or a son or a daughter or a student, a high schooler, a business professional, a sex addict, a person who was never loved, a student who has no direction? Write the list. What do you think will bring real life change? Well, I tell you, I'm with Micah. And with the Apostle Paul. Real life change comes as you are deeply immersed in the word of God that brings you to the cross of Christ by which we are increasingly transformed by the power of the Spirit who builds character into our lives as we walk with him so that the old flesh life and its fruits will become less as Jesus Christ becomes more. That's how it happens. And it works. It's worked in every culture, in every generation, where it has been faithfully pursued. By the way, this isn't just talk. In the book, Ronald Sider quotes George Barna, the pollster, 
who has done so many surveys, and one in particular on what he calls a biblical worldview. Now, what that means, uh, I know it sounds a little complicated, though some are familiar with the phrase, it really means that you've grasped enough of the Bible to make a difference to the way you think and the choices that you make. That's basically what he's talking about. Now, here's the staggering statistic. That amongst those who claim the phrase born again, Barna found in his research that only 9%, 9% of all born again adults have a biblical worldview, 9%. And only 2% of born-again teenagers, that's teenagers who claim to be born again, only 2% have enough Bible in them by their own response to these survey questions to influence the way they think and the way they choose. Quoting these statistics, Sider says with, I think, understatement, that is bad news. Do you think that's an understatement? <laughs> that is bad news. If that's true or anywhere near true, it is hardly surprising that Christians are living just like the rest of the world, right? Because all we've got is a religious veneer over an unchanged life, if that's true. No wonder we're seeing the loss of character, the rise of self-interest, the breakdown of family life even in the church, right? You want the good news? Say you want the good news. <laughs> the good news, I'm quoting, is that the small circle of people with a biblical worldview demonstrate genuinely different behavior. Genuinely different behavior. Listen to this. They are, that is, those who have enough Bible in them to begin to change the way they think and choose. They are nine times more likely than all others to avoid adult-only material on the internet. Nine times. It makes a difference. They are four times more likely to boycott objectionable companies and products. Three times more likely than other adults not to use tobacco products. Twice as likely to volunteer time to help needy people. In fact, 49% of all born-again Christians with a biblical worldview have volunteered more than an hour in the previous week in an organization to serve the poor. Whereas only 29% of those claiming to be born again but without a biblical worldview do so and only 22% of those of Christians who would not own the phrase born again do so. In other words, what he's saying is it's going to change the community. There's a direct correlation between the penetration of the scripture into a person's life and the amount of time that they give to volunteering to serve the poor and the needy. It changes the community. See, the fruit flows from the root. And you can't change the bad fruit unless you change the bad root. Do you see what this is telling us? How can we have less men hooked on pornography by having more men who are immersed in the scriptures? How can we have less breakdown in family life over the next 10 years? by having more families gather together in worship and around the Word? How will we motivate more people to go out and to serve the poor and the needy in our community? It will happen as we're more captivated by the love of Christ so that we're ready to place all other agendas on the altar of God. The way it's going to happen is as the power of the gospel flows through every dimension of our life and our ministry. You see, the gospel is like blood in the body. It carries life, it carries power, and it has to go to every place in the body. Otherwise, if it doesn't go, that part of the body can't function. It's the lifeblood of the body of Christ, the gospel. That is why our vision is for a church more deeply shaped by the Bible, a community more deeply changed by the cross, and a ministry more intentionally reaching the world. 
the joy of being part of the Moody Pastors Conference this year. And at the end of the Moody Pastors Conference, we had Tony Evans preaching. Oh, that was magnificent. To sit in the front row right below Tony Evans preaching, I'll tell you, is something else. I wish I could even imitate the man. I think that he is absolutely marvelous. Well, Tony Evans, in uh, his message to us, got going on the subject of popcorn. How does popcorn pop? That's a great Tony Evans question, right? And he says, you know, a lot of people don't know why popcorn pops. You see, there's a hard shell on the outside, and you can't break it. I was going to bring some popcorn in and and try and chew on it a little bit, and I thought, I don't want the kids to copy that. My dentist in the congregation, he won't like it. (laughs) But what happens? You put the popcorn in the microwave, right? And there is moisture in there, and as it goes in the microwave, the steam is heated, it expands, and what happens? The pressure of what's going on on the inside is more than the strength of the hard shell on the outside. The hard shell cannot bear what is going on in the inside, and so in the end it pops, right? And then you can't even find the shell afterwards. Now you see, that is how God changes a man. Not from the outside in, but from the inside out. That's how the gospel works. Some of us are frustrated to death because what we're trying to do is to change things by chewing on the hard grain, and all we're doing is we're breaking our teeth. There are so many problems in life that end up being changed, not by addressing them directly, but by changing the root so that you change the fruit. Some of us need to get into the microwave, right? The microwave of the gospel. The microwave of the word of God. The microwave of the love of Christ. The microwave of God's Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God uses the word of God that brings us to the Son of God who changes people's lives. That's how the fruit of godly character can begin to grow in you. That's how you can become less selfish and more caring about others. That's how the church gets turned outward rather than inward. That's how the foundation of stable families and stable relationships is laid. That will change our world. Well, this is a message that needs a response, so let's intentionally bow before God in prayer. Maybe as we take a moment in the presence of God, you'll, with me, acknowledge your need just quietly before him, that you'd say to him something like this, Lord, I'm beyond spiritual self-help. The need of my character change, for character change, the need in my family, the power of selfishness within me, something only you can change. And if you can take that step of admitting your need, I want to invite you to put your hope in the gospel as Micah did today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who loves you, who died for you and rose again for you. Put your trust in him that the root of his life will bring new fruit in your life. Ask him then to bind himself to you and by the power of his spirit to start making you a new man, a new woman. And now listen to his promise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. That's his promise to you right now. And if you're a true Christian, will you ask God to give you a real burden for others? Like Micah had. Will you ask him to renew your confidence in the gospel, and to break false confidence in its substitutes.
And then let us ask God to make us a church that believes the gospel with every fiber of our being so that its lifeblood will flow through every part of this body. That we may be a people who bring this good news to thousands who are in darkness in Arlington Heights in the northwest suburbs and throughout the land and to the ends of the earth. O oh God, hear the prayers of your people. In Jesus' name, amen.